Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Um, I'm Valerie Yun, co-chair of the PDLI group within High Water Women's Impact Committee, and I'm very excited to have our speakers here today to talk about entrepreneurship and a great resignation, um, or in slightly more positive terms, the great reshuffling of opportunity for women. Um, many of our speakers today are serial entrepreneurs and have navigated a plethora of challenges along the way, um, from starting their own businesses, and we'll share some of those experiences and lessons learned along the way. This is the second panel of a two-part series focused on women founders, and both sessions are recorded and it will be available for access on demand. Uh, without further ado, I'll dive right into the context around High Water Women as an organization. Uh, it's a 501c3 organization focused on social change powered by professional women. Our mission is the economic empowerment of women and youth. And we do that through three core programs, our financial literacy program, backpacks, and impact investing. The latter of which is focused on curating thoughtful conversations, such as the one today, um, on different topics within the broader uh, impact investing landscape. We launched Investing for Impact back in 2013. We were the very first symposium of its kind in New York, and since we've had over 371 speakers, um, over 122 sessions, and have had over 2,000 participants in our workshops and events. We hope you will join us for some of our upcoming events happening in the fall. Um, for more information on how to become a partner of High Water Women, please reach out to Eleanor Brand. She's our interim executive director. Um, and if you enjoy today's content, please consider making a donation on our website. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Pooja Epinopoli, who is an investment manager at the Women of World Endowment and a core member of our Gender and Diversity Lens Investing Workstream. Over to you, Pooja. Thanks, Valerie. I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping points. Today's discussion will be structured as a 40-minute panel, followed by a 15-minute audience Q&A. So if you have questions that come up at any time during the panel, please post your questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring the box and we will ask your questions to the panelists during the Q&A portion. Now I would love to introduce our moderator, Jeannie Yerman, Senior Director at RT Group, a PR and reputation management firm. Jeannie is a longtime media professional with 16 years of experience as a broadcast journalist covering financial news at CNN, routers, NASDAQ, Bloomberg, and the street. Jeannie, I will hand it over to you. Take it from here. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Pooja. Um, it is such an incredible honor uh, to uh, be sitting with these women today and walking through what they see as the impact of what the uh, pandemic and the great resignation has meant for women in the workforce, both broadly and very specifically for female entrepreneurs. Uh, they have such an incredible depth uh, of experience and insights. So with that, I would really love for all of them to introduce themselves and then briefly describe uh, the company that they have founded. And why don't we start with you, Denise? Absolutely. So um, I, as, as many entrepreneurs, I did not have a linear path. I began as an organizational and behavioral psychologist, <clears throat> heavily focused on the behavior of inclusion, but I pivoted my career to uh, being a lawyer. And I am the attorney that litigated and won the first class action under the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and tried a ton of gender related uh, class actions, race related class actions and so on. Unfortunately, as many of you know, uh, lawyers can sometimes be more part of the problem than the solution. And I was looking for a way to pivot to business. And so I ended up founding a cross-cultural consulting company, scaled it to 65 countries and sold it at Ernst, to Ernst & Young to their human capital division. At Ernst & Young, I uh, led organizational transformation for the Fortune 200, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then left to form a full service uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion firm that developed the MVP, so the minimum viable product, 
uh, for the company that we have today. So it was an inclusion virtual coach app delivering nudge messaging in real time around the actual events where that behavior could be embedded on a team. Uh, the current business is RevWork, and that is the SaaS platform version of what I just described to you. So it delivers nudge messaging in real time around the actual events where behavioral learning like innovation and remote team productivity and leadership resilience um, can be embedded on a team. So we're, we're, we're addressing a lot of the issues we're going to speak to today, mostly with the Fortune 200, but also with mid-market um, and customers and, and, and getting to interact with senior leaders of major companies so that we can really um, get a feel for, for what's going on and, and how to be part of the solution. So I'm excited to be here today, Jeannie, and I know that we have limited time together, so I'll pass it to the next panelist. All right, Jara, do you want to take the uh, mic? Thanks, Jeannie. And i um, so happy to be here today with all of these amazing women. I'm Jara Houston. I'm the co-founder and CEO of WorkWhile. We're a venture-backed labor marketplace that helps the most reliable hourly wage earners connect with shifts that fit their skills, schedule, and location. And as you can imagine, um, the last two years have been a really crazy time for hourly wage earners, right? Everything from record low unemployment at the beginning of 2020 to record high unemployment at the peak of the pandemic. And what's happening now with the great resignation or the great reshuffling, everyone's trying to find a new way to make work work for them. And I'm very excited to be in the middle of it as a labor marketplace, really focused on helping folks who are making anywhere between $15 to $20 an hour find a new path forward uh, and a flexible way to work that works for them. Um, WorkWhile is my third startup that I founded or co-founded and I've had a long career in technology as a product VP at Yahoo um, and have experience raising venture capital here in Silicon Valley. I'm based in San Francisco. So I'm very excited for the conversation to talk about how the change in the labor market and the macro environment is really shifting things and changing the game for women. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and Fran, you're next up. Great. Again, I'm very happy to be here as well. This is um, CEO and founder of BabyQuip. BabyQuip is a marketplace that connects traveling families with independent contractors who want to rent to them cribs, strollers, car seats, and so on. We are the Airbnb, basically, of baby gear. This is my fifth startup. My first was, unfortunately, well over 20 years ago. I was co-founder of Match.com. And then I was at Women.com and BlueLight.com and uh, spent 10 years at Trustee, the internet privacy company. So I feel that my superpower, as it were, is building trusted brands. And when you're dealing with families and children, trust is a really big part of this. I'm interested in this topic as an employer. Most of my team are women. During the pandemic, all of them had two children from infants to teenagers at home. And it was very, very challenging but also our network of what we call quality providers. These are the women who own, mostly women who own the baby gear and rent it on our platform. Um, you know, we've increased that, that community by over 500 and during this great resignation. So obviously we must be doing something that, uh, that, that they want to be doing. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, well, listen, uh, let's just get right into this. Uh, for our audience, just so you know, we're going to kind of walk through this conversation, uh, kind of loosely framing it in terms of the past, the present, and the future, uh, and how the pandemic and the great resignation has reshaped work life for women, whether they're entrepreneurs or they're working for a business. Uh, so turning to the past for a moment, um, with the pandemic, you know, there were a lot of women were very hard hit. They left the workforce in record numbers. I think a, a stat I saw was 6 million, about a million still haven't returned to the workforce. And we know that uh, women were carrying a disproportionate load. There were a lot of downsides to the pandemic, but there were also a lot of upsides. Um, you know, in terms of more flexibility with work, and this is kind of goes hand in hand with the great resignation, women and people in general having more leverage with employers. There's also been a greater opportunity for women to start businesses and also um, 
more room to negotiate, et cetera. So I'd love to hear from you all, um, you know, if you were taking a look at the impact of the pandemic, what in your mind have been some of the, the biggest changes um, that have taken place for women in the work world as a result of the pandemic and the great resignation? Fran, since you're up, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so, you know, I think what it did is it forced people to say to themselves, what do I really want to do and what can I and what can I do? I went to our community and asked them, how many of you sort of quit your job during this last period and why and why did you come to baby quit? And most of it had to do with too much pressure. I was a teacher, I was in healthcare. Um, there was just no way I could manage my job and deal with my kids. Or more positively, I want to spend more time with my children and needed another way of doing it. And so what they found is the flexibility that a gig job can bring. And I'm sure, Jerry, you have some perspective on this as well. So flexibility that, uh, uh, that they could work with their kids or manage their family life but also the ability to make some money and decide how they want, how much they want to work, how much money potentially they want to make and really taking ownership rather than having a boss. I mean, one gal said just straight on, I could not see how I could continue to work and have kids. And that the traditional way has been somewhat, well, we all know it, difficult for women to manage, you know? Um, going into the office, work hours, and so on. Yeah, so there's we, a lack of gratification. Hmm. Denise, what would you add to that? I'll, I'll take a slightly different viewpoint since I've been doing DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion for uh, 20 plus years and mostly with these larger companies. I can tell you that what I was really excited about was that, you know, okay, so as we started to evolve and get used to remote work, I, I thought to myself, okay, this is going to be amazing because, you know, uh, these large companies are going to realize that it's not necessary to be in person to lead, which for a lot of women was a non-starter, right? They would pass on these senior level positions that involved travel and uh, managing large global teams, let, let's say, because they had potentially young children at home. And so they would opt out. And now they're going to be able to demonstrate that it's not necessary. And by the way, obviously that happened in the sense that we, we were able to demonstrate it doesn't take uh, in person to, to lead. However, um, like like history, we are repeating itself. So in any uh, economic downturn or health crisis throughout the world, women and people of color are disproportionately impacted. They have the largest share of um, lower level jobs, part-time jobs, the ones that are the first to go. So they, you know, a lot of the gains that we're hoping to see are not yet there. Um, you know, we hope that they're going to be there. Statistically, they are, you know, we're, we're basically following those, those same patterns. The other upside, um, I think, for most of the women that I interact with, uh, and they're generally, I would say, senior director and above, is that in, in households where they might have been the primary caregiver in conjunction with their other job. And those of you who are doing that know what I'm talking about. You're basically doing two and a half jobs, you, you know, the house and the kids and the work while your significant other spouse, you know, might, might not be. And that other person, whether it's male or female, um, is start, started to realize, A, how difficult it is, B, in many cases, stepped in. And, and it sort of changed the dynamic of the relationship with that, which then moved, you know, the, 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 the woman uh, part of that relationship um, forward. But we're, we're still seeing um, a lag um, and we expect to continue to see that lag for an extended period of time. And I guess the last thing I'll say, you know, is there is a huge difference, obviously, between what would traditionally be considered, say, a blue collar worker, a white collar worker. The, the distinction being blue collar workers often have to be 
right there, you know, on the scene. Um, thought leaders, you know, and 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 uh, knowledge workers get to often have the luxury of of being virtual. And then the third, of course, being um, entrepreneurs or women business owners. Um, they're all impacted quite differently. I know Jara, and I can't wait to hear what Jara has to say. You know, ha, you know, sh, sh, you know, she was saying, "How in the world would I would I have even built this business if it weren't for the pandemic?" But you'll hear other women say, "I don't even know how I survived between losing my bandwidth, you know, on 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 Zoom and other platforms." between regulating their homework, teaching them at some point, dealing with the emotional issues associated with the family and children. So every experience is gonna be unique, but the, the biggest thing is that these gains that we're hoping to see in the long run, which is moving women through the talent pipeline to senior leadership positions um, has not yet been achieved. And we'll, we'll still work towards making that happen. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned Jara. She actually uh, benefited from uh, the pandemic. So Jara, you want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the pandemic has fundamentally changed labor work for all types of workers, but people are benefiting to different degrees. So for me personally, let me talk about my experience as you know, an office worker. I'm sitting in my home office, right? I'm very fortunate. I live in San Francisco. My career has been in tech. My coworkers are engineers, product leaders, right? We work on a computer all day. The product and the user base that we build for though are hourly wage earners who need to be in person. They're working in a factory. They're working in a warehouse. They're doing logistics, deliveries. They're out in the real world, in the physical world. And I think there's been a real dichotomy in the pandemic experience, but I think both both cohorts of workers are converging towards one main need, and that's flexibility. So for me, we started WorkWhile back in 2019. Uh, in 2020, March of 2020, the pandemic hit. Everybody dispersed. We're fully remote teams since that time. And in September of 2020, I had a baby. Right Here I am, a female founder, seed stage company. We had raised three and a half million seed uh, capital from Coastal Ventures, top tier VC firm. And I am a mom for the second time. And for me personally, I can't imagine doing what I did if it hadn't been a fully remote environment where nobody was expecting me to go meet them in person. None of my customers wanted to have an in-person meeting and I have a newborn at home. I mean, for me, like what could have been better? Like that expectation of schlepping to the office or running around or traveling with an infant, all of that was gone. And so for me, you know, a white collar worker, really privileged, um, that was phenomenal. And I was able to be incredibly productive. I was able to be here for my kids. I was able to help my eight-year-old get on Zoom school, right? Because school shut yeah, down. Right, right. Um, and then also spend time with the baby. So, you know, from that perspective, it was amazing. But for the people that we serve, the workers on our platform, it's a very different experience. We did a survey back in February of this year of about 2,000 hourly workers, both folks who are on our platform and hourly workers who are not. And the number two most requested thing after you know higher wages was flexibility. You know, the genie is not going back in the bottle in terms of when I want to work, not for white collar workers and not for blue collar workers. And that's why so many of them are interested in the gig economy and becoming their own boss for the skill set that they have and what they want to do, because nobody can just be given a schedule anymore. It just doesn't work, right? You have obligations, you have family, you have health, you have transportation issues, um, and we're not going back. And I think businesses, our customers are starting to really recognize that if they wanna retain talent and they wanna attract talent, which for the last two years has been really, really hard, they have to over-index and rotate more on flexibility. And that I think is one silver lining, I hope, of this pandemic that businesses, managers recognize that employees are people, they have other obligations than work, and we need to figure out how to accommodate that. You know, if I could add, I just hired a new product manager. I was able to find her out of Cincinnati, which is not a location I would have looked at before. Great experience. And one of the things that was really important to her, millennial, you know, having more flexibility, how much vacation time, what is work-life balance? All these things are becoming even more important. At the same time, 
for my total team, which is now about 17, all remote, 99% women. Okay, we have one guy on the team. We're working for another. Uh, getting together a couple times of the year is really going to be critical to make this team work well. Also, cultural stuff. Um, you know, we, we use an Enneagram so we all can know each other a little bit more. You got to invest a little bit in events, live events, virtual events, and all kinds of management tools. But you can't even think about managing hour by hour. It's not going to happen. So it's interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I like that you, you, you described, Jara, that uh, the genie's out of the bottle and things aren't going to change. I'm curious, though, to know as we kind of shift into kind of a, looking through a present lens, there are some factors out there in the macro environment, such as, um, you know, we're hearing about cuts in the tech industry. Um, there's inflation, um, you know, a possible recession. To what extent are those factors, those macroeconomic factors, going to um, maybe, uh, you know, what, what am I looking for? It's basically have uh, reverse some of the gains or is it, you know, and, and are people, for instance, going to, are women going to lose some of the leverage that they've had um, in seeking um, work-life arrangements that suit them better? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's, um, there's going to be a balance, right? I think we went way in one direction, right? Everyone's at home. You like, like all the buildings are closed and literally boarded up, right? Like if I think back a year ago, like you couldn't find an office building to go into in downtown San Francisco, right? We're opening up. So things are going to move, I think, more towards this middle ground. But my sense is that we are not going to go back to the way that it was right? It's just not going to happen. People ha have become more accustomed. They've built their new routines, right? We're starting to get some inertia in either a hybrid model or the work from home model. You know, I was just talking to a, to a, uh, an old friend um, today who's at a, you know, fortune 10 company and talking about the efforts of trying to get people to go back in the office, um, right? A couple days a week nobody wants to do it because it's kind of like, you have to have this critical mass of having a reason to go all the way to the office, that commute, go back there, right? Um, and people aren't ready to do it yet. So I, I agree with you. I don't think we're going to, it's not all gonna be sunshine and rainbows, um, but I do think we'll hit this middle ground where we're not really going back to, especially for knowledge workers that don't need to physically be in that environment of ever going back to, you know, 60 hours a week at your desk in the office. I just don't see that happening. And the war for talent is real. Even though we're not back to the same labor force participation rates as pre-pandemic, right? There are still a lot of people who are saying like, the labor force is just not for me anymore. Right. And a big reason for that was, you know, your job is not compelling enough for me to risk my life mm. to go yeah. in and potentially catch COVID. It's like, I'm sorry, right? Minimum wage plus $2 is not enough for me to do that. I'm going to figure something else out. Um, and so I just don't see us going all the way back, but you're right. We're not going to be, you know, full-time work from home for everybody. I think we'll hit a balance in the next two years. Well, I worry about the difference between all remote teams versus hybrid remote teams. I think all remote teams can work for everybody and the women will be in the same uh, stature as as the guys in the team and so on, but there's hybrid and some people go in and some people don't. I don't think we know what that impact is going to be on, on women's careers. Well, I also, I also think in terms of, um, you know, going back to your question, um, Jeannie, related to inflation, I mean, you know, it, it look at the stock market, it just kind of goes like this, right? Fortunately, mostly in an, in an upward direction. So I don't think there's any, you know, crystal ball or, you know, silver bullet. The only thing that is for certain is um, that they're going to be certain micro competencies that if you don't have them, you're, you're not going to be able to thrive. I mean, j just think about like everything that all these panelists have said, you know, it's agility, you know, for sure, resilience, for sure, um, empathy, you know, all these micro skills. So, so for example, and Fran, I'll, I'll, I echo what you're saying, that hybrid is another entire 
um, you know, level or a phase of this process. In fact, we just we, we have a hybrid leader masterclass certification on this subject for the micro competencies that we feel are going to be critical um, moving forward, because it's one thing it's one thing to transition from live to, to virtual. And that was a transition. And it was also fraught with, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, potential exclusionary, um, you know, things that would happen on calls and, and what have you. But now with hybrid, you ta- think about any meeting that you've attended where there are live participants and then there are virtual people. It is it is you know, I don't I don't want to it's not impossible, but it takes the kind of facilitator and or leader of, of teams to have this incredible acumen about what not just what people are saying, but what they're not saying, not just about the voices, but about the people that are not speaking. And so it's an extra entire layer of leadership that many have not achieved. And so the ones that are either upskilling for for those competencies or very, very high on the EQ register that are going to thrive. I'd love to hear from the group um, on that note, you know, your thoughts about the importance of FaceTime, um, because there are pros and cons to working remotely, as we all know. Um, You know, I had read something, we we talked about this offline um, about uh, how can, um, you know, managers or rising managers learn to manage if they're not with the people that they're managing. It's tough, like you just described, Denise, to do it remotely. Um, But there are other aspects um, about being in person. So, you know, what are your thoughts? How important is it to have FaceTime? Can you be fully remote? What are the upsides and downsides? I think you can, but I think you have to really work at it and you have to recognize the costs that are required to do it in a way that's going to work, right? So, you know, at Workwhile, we're a small team, but one thing that we did right at the beginning of the pandemic that we've stuck with is have two daily standups. So in a, in a tech company, it's very normal to have like a daily standup where the product engineering team are literally standing up, giving a quick update of what they're working on, what are my blockers, um, to make sure that things are moving forward quickly. And we started doing two a day, which is really weird, right? Nobody does that. Like, why would you do that? What did I do between 10 a.m. and 3 3 p.m.? Like, I don't have another update. But we started to do it because we were fully remote. And we found that it has been actually a really good tactic to keep everybody in check and connected to each other because we all get on a a video call and you do see each other's faces, which I think is important to recognize. I am working with fellow humans. There they are, they're a humanoid shape, right? Like I can start to understand, are you looking happy today or looking sad today? Oh, are you in a different room of your house today, right? You start to build those relationships. And I think having those check-ins every day, it compounds, right? And everything we do in the remote world will compound, right? Because if you spend six months and you're not really having an interaction with somebody on the regular, you don't really know them. And one thing that we try to do is get the entire company in person twice a year. And that's a big effort. It's a big lift. Um, but I think it is, re- it is important because, you know, walk into lunch, you're building those other personal relationships. And that's a thing that I personally haven't figured out. How do you replicate that in the remote only world, right? You need to create the environments where you have more regional meetups. You give people the opportunity to go have a meal together, to hang out, to do something that's not necessarily work-related, to build those to build those relationships, which are so critical to success. We're doing the stand-ups once, once a day, big team meeting once a week, but lots of Slack, you know, get everybody to, to learn how to use Slack effectively. Um, getting together twice a year. And now I'm trying to encourage my managers to get together with their team, be it that they travel to another state, have a little bit of a meetup, because I think we really need to have the connections. We also are doing, you know, at least quarterly, I do a virtual event, something fun, virtual, you know, uh, cooking class, uh, scavenger hunt, And there's a lot of these things and that gets to the softer side, 
But I would tell you at least once a week, I know there's some problem that could have been solved more quickly had we been in the room and said, hey, look at this, what's going on here? And that's the kind of thing we're also losing out of. I think also it, it, it pays to just have a certain protocol about how you deal with, with the, you know, video, what you're really saying is video versus non-video. Because there are certain social cues, as Gerald pointed out, that you just can't get if you're at, and also ener the energy associated with innovation, right? This is the thing that we're most worried about. Uh, one of the things we're most worried about with, with uh, you know, companies that just thrive on innovation and a tech, tech company would absolutely fall in that category that there's a certain human energy that happens when you're physically in the same room. And so there, so video is the only substitute we have right now for that and should be encouraged. However, there are certain people that might have, you know, certain unique aspects about their family life or, or about who they are as human beings or practicalities. So, so if we reach out and or have some sort of a confidential survey system where, where we're saying, are there any unique challenges that you have about appearing on video so that people can, you know, respond and you can get the best possible solution for the most amount of people. The other thing is, and this is, this, this is actually to tie it back to us as entrepreneurs, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So our software has evolved um, to a large extent to em embrace and capitalize on the need of people to interact with each other, you know, balanced against, let's say, the, the needs of a, of a company that have significant restrictions on how they interact. So for example, Fran, you know, something like Slack does, does work, but, you know, does also for, especially for a very large company, require incredible monitoring, you know, and curating in case someone is abusing it, right? So we actually evolved our software such that in the cohort that's on the software, they can kind of see what each other is working on in terms of where, what, what content they're accessing in the app. Uh, but they they don't actually have the ability to communicate back and forth because otherwise these larger companies are not going to want to use our software uh, because they don't want to curate it in yet another environment. However, uh, and again, this was totally as a result of of you know not pivoting but sort of adapting to the needs of you know post COVID environment. We, we did do Microsoft Teams integration. Why? Because most of our cu customers were used to that. Um, Fran, you guys are using Slack, but most of our customers are using Microsoft Teams. And so it, it, it was an easier environment for them to monitor and curate because they're on it all the time. And so they can get their nudge messaging, their thoughts for the day, their inspiration through Teams and then not create the kind of situation where um, where there's a just yet another another adaptation that they have to to make. So I mean I think it's super interesting um, that most most startups most entrepreneurs, if if they have what it takes to you know survive and thrive you know in, in through something like this, and they can either pivot or align with what's happening, you know, sociologically, um, you know, we're the ones that are, I hope it's we, um, <laughs> we're the ones that are, are, are going to make it and have that resilience to, to, to do just about anything. Cause it's short of something apocalyptic, you know, it doesn't get much worse than this in terms of the pivot. I, I, in addition to everything that we've spoken about, we have companies that where the demand is high for their for their product, but they can't deliver because of the supply chain. You know, so they're basically victims of their own success. And if they if they can't, you know, be agile and move forward and somehow survive that and or leverage what's happening for their advantage in terms of growth, then they won't survive either. So, you know, these these nuances are just fascinating and tracking them and tracking the progress is also, you know, equally fascinating. Great. Um, taking a look at the, you know, uh, the road ahead, uh, you know, where do you see the biggest opportunities for women? I, and this could be anything. This could be, you know, um, industry, uh, geography, et cetera. 
But if you were advising a friend, um, what would you say? Maybe I'll, I'll take the mic since I had it and then pass it on to everyone else. I, I'm just going to speak for people who are in relatively large companies and who really want to, you know, progress through middle management to senior leadership and to, this, to the C-suite. I'll limit my comments to that, is that this is your time. So if you can pull it off, if you're not, if you don't have, you know, certain burdens at home that make this, you know, untenable, if you're in a company that has the kind of organizational culture that you love, that you feel that you can thrive. This is the time to put it out there that you have the capacity to lead and, and ask, what is it going to take for me to move to the next level and then take systematic steps to, um, to, to achieve that? It's also the time you know, because employees have all the power right now, that the, the, the competition for talent is so high. If you're not in a good environment, if you're not in an organizational culture where, you know, where you can thrive, where you can be em empowered, where, where the organization doesn't stand for what you stand for, this is the time to move. It might seem weird and strange because you may be remote or hybrid in your new environment. And maybe it feels more comfortable to stay now. But this this power in the hands of the employee will not last forever. That's another, I said there's you know, only one or two for sure things. This is for sure. I mean, you know, everything is cyclical, everything. So that's, that's my strongest advice um, right now. Denise, I've often uh, thought about it as like a, a buyer's market. Like right now, the person seeking a job, it, it, they have the upper hand, but like you say, that won't last. Um, what about you, Jara or uh, Fran? Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to um, kind of the industry that I know the best, just, uh, you know, tech and startups, right? Um, the economy is cyclical and we have had some crazy um, peaks. And I think we're TBD if we're going to see some crazy troughs, right? But like, if you just sit back and reflect on what has happened in the last two, two and a half years, I mean, it has never happened in anyone's lifetime, right? Like it's been, it's been crazy. And I think that we are also go, go, go that we don't step back and, and really reflect on the significance of what's happened in terms of the whole world shutting down, right? In terms of the stimulus spending that happened in this country, which has now caught up to us, right? Because we're in, experiencing 40 year high inflation. We're gonna have, we have a rising rates environment. You know, the Fed is trying to cool things down. The Fed is actively trying to increase unemployment, right? Cool down the labor market. So things are, are very, very, um, are very crazy right now. And we've had some crazy movements. Like the volatility has been really more than anything that I've seen in my career. And so what I would say, to, to women who are looking to make a move or wondering how they should play this is I think really great companies are built in downturns mm -hmm. because it requires strong teams that have clear differentiation, that have a clear value, that are building something that people really want to buy, right? That's solving a real problem. And those teams are gonna be successful. And if you can find a team that is doing that, um, that didn't fall victim to kind of like the spin, spin, spin last 18 months, which is why we're starting to see some tech layoffs is because people overshot spending into this demand that wasn't sustainable. Um, it's a really, really interesting time to build something that's going to last because you're going to be forced to make tough decisions from the very beginning and finding a team and a leadership team that you think is well prepared to weather that kind of storm is the most important thing. I think if you don't have that kind of confidence, um, it's not the time to make a move. I guess I would add to this, I agree with both of you, that, um, and we've talked about this, resilience, agility, but I also would add risk-taking. You might be in a position now that if you're in a secondary market, you're not in Austin or San Francisco or LA, that there might be some really good positions for you that wouldn't have been available under you know, pre-pandemic, non-remote. So if you've got some skills and you're in some of these other locations, you might be very valuable to a much broader range of companies than you were otherwise. And if you're miserable in your job, 
then find something else. I mean, there are a lot of good opportunities, even gig economy opportunities that people like and have a lot of gratification with. I totally agree with you, Jara, about high performing teams and trust. So I know that both my current team and even you know, the corporate team, as well as our quality providers, they like working with other women. I mean, they're finding this to be, and many of them have said, I find it easier. People understand. We're more transparent. There's less game playing. I'm not, you know, it's hard for me to know what it's like in another kind of company. But what I do know is the women who are working with us as contractors and working on the team like the culture that a women-oriented team ha has built. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we've often heard about and read about how leadership these days needs to be empathetic. Um, mm. And, you know, the smart employers um, are uh, listening to employees and, and job prospects um, or applicants about what it is that they want. But they also, you know, they have, they understand the human side and they have to, right? Um, you know, we would be remiss to not talk about fundraising, uh, venture capital, because I'm sure there are a lot of women and men potentially listening uh, who are interested to know, you know, what has it been like to raise money in the last couple of years? And what do you think it's going to be like now in the year ahead? Well, Jara and I both have raised money recently, almost 100% remotely, which is kind of crazy. I mean, you know, no meetings with VCs, no going up and down Sand Hill Road. I kind of missed it to some degree, but that what it does allow is more opportunity to meet with more potential investors. Mm -hmm. I also met with a lot of female investors and they were happy with the flexibility as well. So at least at this point in time, I don't think, I, I, I think it's really changed. Brand quick. Quick follow up to that. Do you did you find or have you found that it's actually easier to get meetings that you might not have otherwise gotten? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. but there's more there's more calendar spots. You can go through them real quickly. People are yeah, you can do a meet and greet for 30 minutes. You don't have you know, the the people that you're dealing with don't have to get on a plane or in the car, and neither do you. I mean, we've raised money also during actually, with the exception of our first round, only through um you know, through r remote and, you, you know, you, you sit there and you share your, your PowerPoint and you, you, you know, you can get feedback, you know, right, right on the fly. And so I, I actually, I, I love person to person personally, because I, 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 again, I feel like there's no substitute for that, but short of that, I think, you know, you're, you're able to contact way more people. In fact, it, it just, it, it amazes me that prior it was mostly local to where we're in San Diego and it was mostly California. And now I'm getting, you know, I'm getting meetings in Florida in New York and all, you know, all over the country. I mean, and sometimes from funds that are called like, I'm not going to name a, a, a VC, but, you know, Florida VC, you know, and, and, and at first I, I responded and I said, you do know we're in California. Right. And they're like, yeah. And, you know, they they don't care anymore because whereas it was important um, in another context to have more frequent um, contact and to support the local community, which is also important. Now, you know, you can choose talent from anywhere. And by the way, for those of you who are in, in companies, what that also means is that there is no longer an excuse not to have a diverse slate of candidate to interview people because you can get them from just about anywhere. You know, like if you, you can't say, oh, in my geography, we don't have a lot of people of color, really, because it really doesn't matter anymore. Okay, or point. or we don't have we don't have that many female engineers, you know, in, in San Diego. So, you know, get them from Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of ancillary to that. But, you know, it seems like the other panelists echo this. I think it's actually been a positive thing. I've, I haven't felt any negativity from that. It'd be interesting yeah. to see what the VCs on this call feel, if there are any VCs on the call. Yeah, I mean, I think, Fran, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the opportunity, right? And like now that things are remote friendly, um, you can live somewhere outside of 
San Francisco, New York, um, other tech hubs and still raise money and still make those connections. I mean, some of our investors now live in Florida or DC and maybe they yeah, started the at, yeah. Yeah, in fact, maybe they started at like a Silicon Valley uh, VC, but then they've decided oh, my, my life is somewhere else. My family is somewhere else and I'm still gonna do my job but I'm gonna be somewhere else. So it's a huge opportunity um to be able to make those connections and not have to be restricted by geography and i think to your point denise for diversity it's huge yeah. right like because now you see like more in interest in places like atlanta i mean that's amazing like i think like the pandemic remote world has been really great for different areas and what's happening in miami that sucking sound of like some folks trying to make miami happen as a tech hub for texas I mean, all of this is, is good for opportunity everywhere. Great. Um, we're going to now shift into a Q&A session. Um, we do have a question um, from an undergraduate student who is looking for advice about how to get into the financial investing sector of the economy. Uh, what would be your best advice for them? Take that, Jara. Well, I don't know if I'm the best person to give uh, to give an answer here, but um, you know, my first job out of college was sales and trading. I worked on a bond trading floor. Yeah. Uh, I was a research analyst for uh, Latin American credit markets, um, and you know, I think the best way as a young person trying to get into any kind of industry is to try to do those internships and try to make those connections. Right, find a mentor, and maybe it's someone who graduated a couple of years prior who can just tell you the deal. Right, because VC investing, hedge funds, finance all of these industries have unwritten rules and if you don't know how the game is played it's going to be really hard to get in and so i would encourage anybody who's in college to try to find someone who's maybe three to five years out and ask them how they did it and tell them like what are the events i got to go to like what's the first job i got to get like what does that tra trajectory look like um, to make sure that you know you know how um, how everything works I don't have that thing to add. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I think um, I, I will just say basically generically what used to apply still applies. Companies get hundreds of resumes um, and the, the way to get um, a, a job now is the same as it was before, which is to leverage your network. Do not think that you're going to put a resume into some portal and ever see the light of day. I mean, if you do, God bless you. I think that's awesome. But generally speaking, be active on LinkedIn, leverage um, your, your network. I mean, I mean, I will tell you, this is, this is my, how I'm just being completely transparent about how I am. That may not be how other people are. But generally, because my business involves connecting with senior leaders, right? That's where I benefit them and they benefit me. So I'm very focused on that. But there is a unique moment in time, and that is right at the beginning of someone's career, particularly if they're female, that if they reach out to me and say, so-and-so is in your network, do you know them well enough to put in a good word for me? Here is, here's my resume. I graduated at the top of, of my class. If I feel there's a reasonable you know, hope that the information I'm getting is true, and if if I feel I can provide value to a senior leader who's looking for an entry level position, you know, I will make that connection. I won't say this is the greatest person, I, you know, in, since since sliced bread because I don't maybe don't know them. But I will say, you know, I came across this resume. She seems highly qualified. I interacted with her briefly on LinkedIn. She's enthusiastic. Do you want to interview her? I mean, it takes me 33 seconds to do that. Right. Yeah. Once once people are a little further along, you know, I because I'm so busy, I I, I might not interact with them because I kind of feel like, you know what, um, you know, I they can do it on their own. But getting into the workforce, especially right from college or graduate school, is not the easiest thing. And I have kids in their 20s and I've seen it and I see how dejected they get. And so I will really kind of go out of my way because I can empathize with what they're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing are basically warm introductions. Right, 
right? Exactly. What it takes these days. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, in my experience, it's disregarding the algorithms and the LinkedIn and how do you beat it? How do you use keywords? It really, everybody I know, it's, it's all warm introductions. Right. Um, switching to another question that also relates to connections. Um, somebody is asking, uh, what advice do you have for a young woman who's trying to make connections for their startup? Yeah, so I advise a lot of female-led early stage startups, and I almost always say a couple things. One, in every community, there are some startup meetups or something like that. Start to go to those, either virtual or in real life. Those can be very helpful. Think about doing a uh, accelerator or incubator. It doesn't have to be YC to be worthwhile. Just getting and working with some other mentors, some of the businesses that serve startups and other startup founders will really, really help. Also, most universities probably have something going on to support the startup community. So get involved there. And there's a lot of female oriented uh, groups, accelerators, uh, resources like um, Hello Ellis, I think is really good for, for early stage startups and small businesses. So there's a lot of resources and, um, you know, get your pitch deck done really well and get some feedback on it. People will help you do that. And that could open up a lot of doors. I just want to say one thing in conjunction with accelerators and uh, incubators, just please be careful of what you're giving away. If you have, if you're being funded and you have a reasonable amount of money, you're better off paying for consulting or paying for the incubator than giving away your equity. I know too many founders who by the time they get to series A have given away just about all of their company. You'd be surprised how far it goes. It takes a lot of equity to move through the various stages of funding and you do not want to give that away. And you, you as, as a human being, don't want to be at the end of that you know, picture and not end up with something substantial in terms of a wealth event for everything that you have worked for. Yeah, so yeah, that's the only know. caveat. You know, Fran, I had came across companies that called themselves accelerators and incubators, and they really weren't. Right. You got to do your homework and so right. on. But right. I, you know, Stanford has StartX. They don't take any equity at all. Um, I was with another one for a little bit that actually invested on the same terms. So, you know, as other investors. So, yeah, you got to be smart about it. But I do think there are a good filtering and a good coaching opportunity. The good ones anyway. Yeah. I would add, um, get on Twitter. Um, I think there's a lot of community, especially for founders, uh, female founders, um, early stage startups that is to be had if you can be active there. And you find the community that is building in your space, who the most active people are, who the most active investors are, and get in the mix on the conversation because I think founders in general are uh, very generous people. And if you're following someone, if you're engaging with them back and forth in a public forum and you DM them and ask for advice or a favor, more likely than not, you'll get something, right? You'll get some intelligence or some feedback. Um, and I think that for me personally, it's being able to leverage those founders um, and ask them, hey, how did you do this? Or how did you think about that? Or do you know this? That can really short circuit your development. Right, because these are people who um, have been there, done that, uh, and they can certainly be in a position to help you leapfrog, right, go forward. And so, I wouldn't discount um, some of the, you know, public forums out there. Uh, and there's all these like new um, Slack communities for female founders, um, for seed stage companies in your specific niche. Um, and I would encourage you to join as many of those as you can. That's terrific. Um, it seems like there's such a good blend of both the digital um, opportunities and the in-person opportunities. And before I move on, real quickly, the the uh, site you mentioned, Fran, it's Ellis. How would you spell that? Oh, hello, Ellis. Hello, Ellis. Thank you. A and hello, A L I C E. Okay, got it. Um, so. Uh, we do have uh, one other question here because we're coming up on time. Um, let's see. This says, um, 
This was a very informative event. I'm an undergraduate student majoring in engineering. My dream is to become an innovator, but I lack knowledge in business and marketing. Where should I start? Don't worry about it. <laughs> like, I was going to say, didn't one of you say that I'm not, I wasn't an engineer and I started the business anyway, right? Yeah, I, I said that. It's, 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 it's yeah. yeah, it's, into, it's intimidating. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not an engineer either. And, and, I, and you know, I'm, I'm the founder of a tech company. So there are plenty of um, engineers out there that can bridge the relationship between your thought leadership or intellectual property and um, engineering, if you do want to be in a in a tech company, I will say, and I, I bet you that there are, there are some of the panelists may disagree. I'm so glad I got my law degree because it, it it has saved us so much money. But I wish I had also gotten an MBA because my MBA came the hard way through a ton of you know initial uh, mistakes that fortunately worked out for me. But, you know, if I could do it again, I think I would have gotten both degrees um, or at least some sort of, you know, an executive MBA to get sort of jump started. Because it's not, you know, this particular question was about marketing and and I think she said business generically. When you are a founder, you are you're you are changing um, ideation to execution. You are, you know, dealing with legal issues, with operational issues, with scaling. There are so many different things coming at you that, you know, the more foundation you can create from the beginning, the better. I have a little different approach. I think, um, you know, focus on your area of expertise, what you're passionate about, and recognize that you cannot build a company by yourself. You do not have to be the best engineer and the best marketer and the best business person. As a founder CEO, you probably do have to be the best fundraiser, but telling your own story... <laughs> sure. That's yeah. where it's going to come from, right? You're not going to hire someone to do that. Um, and I think sometimes women, and maybe I'm just outing myself, think that they got to do it all. I got to be good at everything. And you don't, right? You got to be good at building the team that's good at everything, right? So as, as someone who's an undergrad or you're focused on innovation or engineering, just get really good at the thing you're really good at. Um, and then meet other people. And you guys are going to come together and you're going to find people that compliment you. And more specifically, you know, if you're an engineer, you're probably going to have some good opportunities. I think initially I would seriously consider a large company because you're going to be able to learn about engineering culture, but also a larger company culture, how the product team works and all of that. And then maybe your next move is to a smaller company where you personally could have more impact. But it's hard to turn down that large company experience if it's the right one. And you're, again, still be passionate about it. Totally agree. Terrific and great advice. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are at time. Um, so I would like to thank uh, our panelists, Fran Meyer and Denise Hummel and Jara. Your last name's escaping me. <laughs> Houston. Then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you guys have been terrific and the advice has been absolutely invaluable. Um, so thank you for your time and your insights. Uh, it sounds like it definitely is a time to take advantage of the, the job market out there. And as it was said at the top of the conversation, shape a job and a work life that works for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Valerie. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Jeannie, and thank you to uh, Denise, Jara, Fran, um, who are with us today. I certainly feel very inspired and motivated to continue the conversation offline. Hope that many of you feel compelled to do the same as well. Um, we will have the replay up by early next week to share with you and for those who are unable to attend today's session. Um, and finally, you know, a big thank you to our supporters who make this work possible. Um, like Arthur Foundation and Trilink Global, who's been a longtime friend of High Water Women. Um, if you are interested in learning more about the organization or some of the upcoming events, or even want to become a partner, um, please reach out to Eleanor Brand. Her information is listed here. And um, if you like the content and the work we produce, please consider making a donation in support of High Water Women. Um, again, finally, thank you to everyone who helped make this session possible, including uh, Pooja, Caroline, Emily, Shannon, and Eleanor. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon uh, for the next session. Thank you.